It's March 22nd, 1882, and another remarkable event is about to be uncovered by Ariel, Rebecca, and Ali, the Retrospectors. The removal of the world's largest elephant was remonstrated against by the whole British nation and was accomplished in the face of seeming insurmountable objections. Now, that might sound like a damning news article that I'm quoting from, but it is, in fact, a poster advertising the opportunity to come see Jumbo, (laughs) the aforementioned six-and-a-half-ton elephant at Barnum's Circus on his ill-fated tour of the United States, which effectively kicked off today in history in 1882 when he was removed from London Zoo, having been purchased by Barnum for $10,000. And it took considerable time to load the cranky elephant into the reinforced wood and iron crate by which he was to be transported to the London docks. And this was being done in the early hours of the morning, precisely because the backlash to his removal had been so intense. And the crate was accompanied by six police officers to keep any curious onlookers at bay, Jumbo stretching out his trunk through the gap in the crate so that a female admirer could approach and pour ale and buns into his mouth. (laughs) Well, that's a sort of depressing part of the story. Story, which is that Jumbo was a, a bit of an alcoholic, frankly, because he had been, well, let's face it, mistreated in a lot of different ways down the years. So he was originally born in Sudan. He was an African bush elephant, born in uh, around 1860. And after his mother was killed by poachers, he was captured and sold to an Italian animal dealer and explorer and taken to France, where he was kept in a Parisian zoo. But his really sort of runt-like stature failed to wow the crowds and he was really badly neglected by his French keepers uh, before he was just sort of shipped off to London Zoo in 1865. In exchange for a rhino, a kangaroo, a possum, a jackal, a pair of eagles and two dingoes. That is a good trade. (laughs) (laughs) Because London Zoological Gardens, as it was then, desperately wanted an African elephant. All that had been seen in England before was an Indian elephant. And African elephants are larger. So... You know, London was desperate to have this giant elephant. And then actually when he arrived, he was disappointingly small, as you said, because he'd been maltreated. And it took the handler, Matthew Scott, who built a great bond with Jumbo during his 17 years at the zoo to really build him up to the size that he should have been, Mm. which was around 13 foot as an adult. Mm. He became this total sensation and was a firm favourite of everyone from uh, the Queen on down. Apparently, Queen Victoria's children used to come for rides. He gave hundreds of thousands of rides through Regent's Park. I mean, you know, conservation was not really part of zoology in these days. (laughs) The natural elements of the animals being displayed were not only kind of not being discussed, but almost being suppressed in a very Victorian way. One of the reasons that they wanted rid of Jumbo in the end was because he was starting to get erections and the idea that the Victorian public would be faced with a giant elephant penis (laughs) was something that felt... It's insensitive when it was known for being a favourite of Queen Victoria's children. Yeah, I mean, he was nicknamed the children's pet, so you can see how his four-foot-long erection probably wasn't (laughs) going to tie into that image. Um, Like many a human celebrity, you know, his public persona was very much at odds with what was going on behind the scenes. And, Mm. you know, the publicity team surrounding him were working to hide this, you know, this dark side. His behaviour was also becoming increasingly aggressive. You know, he he was frustrated, of course, being kept in an enclosure. He had started to ground his tusks against the stone wall and he was increasingly being seen as a bit of a ticking time bomb so Abraham Bartlett who was the director of the zoo was really keen to get him off his hands because you know obviously you know you're having this star attraction who's known as the children's pet and you know Queen Victoria's children are feeding him sticky buns you really don't want a gruesome trampling incident yeah And the news that Jumbo was going to be sold off, and not just sold off to anyone, but sold off to P.T. Barnum, who, you know, Jumbo had come to be seen as this British national treasure at this point, an institution of London Zoo. And the idea that this flashy American showman was going to take Mm. him overseas and put him in his circus was seen as very objectionable. You know, the, the spectator termed the reaction... Jumbo mania, the campaign to save him included inundating Queen Victoria with 100,000 letters from school children pleading for a royal intervention and, less whimsically, a, a legal challenge. It even inspired songs, multiple songs. One of them was called, you can imagine, a music course like Doobly Doop. 
doop in the background. Why part with Jumbo, the pet of the zoo? <laughs> yeah, I guess the English public felt that sort of brash American money had won the day. Uh, Barnum Bailey and Hutchinson Circus ended up paying $10,000 for him, which is equivalent to like, you know, half a million or something ridiculous now, and set about advertising him as towering monarch of his mighty race. Yeah. Uh, meanwhile, 15,000 people turned up to London Zoo on his last day and gave him a whole load of goodbye presents, um, including, as you were saying earlier, some booze, because it was known that uh, that was one of the ways they tried to pacify his uh, more natural urges. Yeah, and then as he was being taken, huge crowds lined the streets of London to watch him being transported to the ship where he was going to begin this journey to America. And uh, Jumbo himself was seemed pretty against the move, and he actually refused to enter the comparatively small box that had been prepared for him. And he eventually had to be bound by chains, which only served to intrigue the public more, I suppose in that way because, you know, like the image that we have of King Kong being bound by chains, you know, this was a powerful mm -hmm. animal being subdued in this way so as to take this journey. Um, but by the time he arrived in New York, it's rumoured that the largest crowd ever seen in the city had gathered around, scaling walls and standing on top of each other just to get a glimpse of him as he arrived. And he was the star attraction for Barnum and Bailey's for three years. We'll get to what happened to the end of that three years in a moment. It's not pleasant. But in that three years, it was something folkloric, I'd go as far to say. Um, because like the, the, the association you even have in your mind when you think about Circus Day coming to a small American town that you've seen in movies or read about in books, you know, local factories closed, schools cancelled classes, and everyone went to see the elephant. The elephant became this iconic thing of American entertainment. And Jumbo was used by Barnum... Obviously, as a driver of huge publicity and their advertising deals with tobacco companies and trade cards and all the rest of it, but also to attract a different audience. Until this point, it had been mostly men that had been going to Barnum and Bailey, partly to see women in sort of, you know, small costumes. This was, especially with the background of prohibitions on nudity increasing, a way of saying, families, come and come and watch the circus. It's for you. Mm. Yeah, and I mean, obviously, P.T. Barnum, no stranger to showmanship, also arranged lots of attention-grabbing stunts to flaunt his prize attraction to the public, including a parade of 21 elephants. He was not short of an elephant or two. <laughs> Over the Brooklyn Bridge in 1884, the bridge had opened the year previously, and there had been a sort of deadly stampy kind of crush at one of the exits, so there were concerns over its safety, people weren't using it. So to demonstrate how safe the bridge was, you had this parade of 21 elephants going across it. <laughs> sure. Um, but eventually... Uh, all good things must come to an end. And Jumbo was actually killed in 1885 after he was hit by a train. There's a bit of a legend surrounding how he died because the story is that uh, Jumbo and the circus were travelling in Canada when this tragedy struck and a portion of the fence along the railway was missing. And as the keepers were loading up Jumbo and another baby elephant called Tom Thumb, a train came barreling towards them. And uh, while they were going to the train, an unexpected freight car was heading down the track straight for the elephants. A keeper apparently yelled to them to get out of the way and then Jumbo was hit. Barnum went around telling people that Jumbo had actually pushed Tom Thumb at, off the tracks before the train came barreling down it. So he had this story about the heroism of Jumbo saving this little elephant and yeah. sacrificing himself on the tracks. Yeah, I mean, Barnum's chutzpah in the face of what was clearly negligence is extraordinary. I mean... African elephants should live until they're 60-odd, and he died at 24. Mm. Uh, and, of course, what Barnum then did is think, OK, well, how do I get my investment back? So he mounted an international tour of Jumbo's 13-foot-high skeleton <laughs> and brought over his, quote, grief-stricken widow Alice from London Zoo. <laughs> he gets on the phone to London Zoo and was like, we've hit a bit of a snag here with Jumbo. <laughs> yeah. Can you send me... A female elephant. Yeah. And then he spun this story with the papers that, like, when Alice first saw the stuffed skin of Jumbo, she started to cry when she realised he was dead as she looked into his glassy eyes. I mean, it's just <laughs> genuinely, like, sickening treatment of animals when you read about it. What, what they did to try and basically recoup their investment. Yeah. yeah, he had the hide stuffed and toured it separately to the skeleton for two mm. years. So he was, you know, he'd created these circuits. You know, he wasn't going to let the death of Jumbo deter him from milking the Jumbo name. He actually, if anything, managed to double the attraction because now Jumbo could be in two, two places Jumbos. at once. And you can still go and visit Jumbo's bones if you're so 
inclined at the American Museum of Natural History periodically, where they were on display for decades. And pretty much every fictional elephant you've ever loved has been influenced by Jumbo, even if you didn't realise it. You know, obviously Dumbo being the most obvious example, but also the likes of Nelly the elephant. She packed her trunk and said goodbye to the circus. Mm -hmm. Pretty much any depiction of a circus elephant has its roots in Jumbo, especially one who likes sticky buns. As far as I can tell, Jumbo is where the sticky bun elephant begins. Oh, wow. Just so few of them had alcohol addiction issues. That's the (laughs) the one place where they differ. (laughs) Nelly the elephant packed a trunk and went off to the priory. (laughs) (laughs) Tomorrow strikes me listening to it now. It's just so kind of de dum de dum de dudly dum isn't it? I mean, it's great. It's beautiful music, but... Ditch the ads and get a Sunday episode when you join Club Retrospectors. Subscribe now on Apple Podcasts. Part of the ACAST Creator Network.